Hi, welcome everyone, and thanks for making it here on a busy day on campus. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Ulrike Luhmann today. Uh, Ulrike um, got her uh, PhD from uh, Max Planck Institute of Meteorology in 1996. Uh, she then went and got her postdoc, um, or did her postdoc at the University of Victoria in Canada, and then uh, got a faculty position at, um, um, what is it called, Dalhousie University mm -hmm. in Halifax. She stayed there for seven years, and then in 2004, uh, moved back to Europe to um, Switzerland and got a, a professorship at ETH in Zurich. And uh, that's where I visited Ulrike uh, the first time in 2006 as a graduate student uh, doing a, a research stay abroad. And since then, Ulrike has been a, a wonderful mentor for me and she was my advisor for, for my postdoc. And so it's, it's my great pleasure to have her here today. And uh, with that, uh, welcome Ulrike. And Thanks a lot for the invitation. It's also my pleasure being here after I've promised or tried to try to come quite a few times, but then I don't fly so much anymore. Luckily, I don't fly so much anymore because now I'm in a beautiful country, as you can see here, so there's no reason to go anywhere where you can't go by public transport. Um, <laughs> So yeah, so what I'm going to present today is some of the research that we have been doing. And I've, I, I do quite a diverse range of things. I look at ice nucleation in detail and I do climate modeling. So it's a huge span and differences. And I'm going to present aspects of both of it. And this picture here is actually taken from a high mountain peak. We have, um, it's called the Jungfeuerhof, where we are at 3,500 meters. And there's a research laboratory. And it's nice to study cloud processes in detail because it's around 30 to 40 percent of the time it's inside clouds. And if not, you can just enjoy a, a beautiful scenery there. So, um, yeah, so I'm starting with a big view on things. I have also been involved in the, in the last assessment report of the IPCC and also in the one prior to that. And I guess you're all familiar with what the IPCC is all about, that we are trying to estimate the different influences that humans exert on climate. And if you do that, we know pretty well by now, if you compare the radiative forcing between 1750 and 2011, that the biggest contribution is from CO2 and other well-mixed greenhouse gases, so there's no surprise there. And those of you working with CRUDA at least also know that there's aerosol particles that do the opposite. They have a negative radiative forcing, and what you see here is that there is a large uncertainty bar associated with that. The confidence level, especially when it comes to aerosol cloud interactions, is only low. We don't know a whole lot about it. But what you also, those of you who have seen the similar figure from the AR4, from the fourth assessment report that was published six years ago, the numbers were a little different. They are given here in green. So then you can see what, what basically has changed in those six years. There hasn't been a lot of change if it comes to aerosol radiation interaction, instead that we call it differently, and I'll go into that on the next slide. But what you see that there has been quite a change from what we thought, what we know about the radiator forcing due to aerosol cloud interaction previously to, to now. And I'll also go into that. What happened then, and that's worthwhile to point out, if you look at the total anthropogenic forcing, then you see that had, that has increased by quite a bit, by 0.8 watts per meter square. Because, for one, over that period of time, over the past six years, the CO2 forcing has increased as CO2 is constantly rising. And if the total aerosol forcing is less negative, that also is a positive forcing. And then what you see is that it goes up from 0.6, I think, to 2.2 or 2.3. So it's not a 0.8, it's 0.6 or 0.7, that's the difference that you see there. So that says with even more certainty that we have known before, human changes since industrial times have contributed to a positive form forcing, i.e. warming. 
Okay, so I said that we have changed the terminology and it's not to have something new every few years, but it has because the aerosol community got into the habit of having its own slangs in saying direct effect, semi-direct, cloud albedo, lifetime, thermodynamic, glaciation, I don't know what. A myriad of different processes. And if you don't work in that area, you do really don't know what that all is and how important are those differences. And so we decided to classify that a little more intuitively. Everything that has to do with the aerosol interacting with the radiation is now called um, irradiant changes from aerosol radiation interaction. It's longer, but it's more precise. And everything where the forcing is changed because the aerosol interacts with the cloud <coughs> is now called that. And then we have two sides. One is the traditional direct effect is um, what we call now radiative forcing. And then, um, and so this is basically, you, you have the aerosols, what they can do is either reflect or absorb solar radiation, period. And that's a pure radiative forcing. You can keep everything else constant, just look at that. But in the atmosphere, the minute you, you add some aerosols in there, some, er some other things will happen. For instance, if it's an absorbing aerosol, then you warm the atmosphere, the stability may change. Or if it's inside a cloud droplet, you may get evaporation going on. And so what it is, is that adjustments occur. And they can be manifold. And so basically what we have done now is to say everything that is not the forcing, the forcing meaning you keep everything else constant, constant meteorology, everything constant, but the forcing agent that you change is called adjustments. And they occur normally on time scales that are much faster than the warming that you have from greenhouse gases, so much faster than what you have over the 100 year time scale or so. And so you can lump that together and then we call it an effective radiative forcing. And the same you can do over here. Here traditionally this has a zillion of different names, cloud albedo, Tumi effect, whatever else, and then you have all the different adjustments and I go a little more into that. But to start off with um, uh, motivating that or introducing this a little more, there is actually, the question always is, can we observe those things? Are these pure constructs or what, what, what is this? And the cloud albedo effect is actually something that you can observe. And if you see that, you can see it in terms of ship tracks. So this prominent example here is off the coast of Washington, where you have in gray some background clouds and overline are those white tracks. And if you look closely, what happens if you fly through them, you can associate what this is due to. Because so here, this is from a different study, but it's similar in idea. Here you have a background cloud extending over um, a kilometer. And then here, between those two dashed lines, you have the ship track. And if you look, the aerosol concentration was 10 times higher within the track going from 100 to 1,000 per cubic centimeter. And so you see that this is, this, is a, this is really the perturbation from the ship. You could speculate if there's like water vapor or if the heat matters, but because over the, we are over the ocean, any additional water vapor input would just be negligible. Um, and so then if you look at the cloud droplet concentration, you see that this increased from around 20 to 30 in the background cloud to around 100 within the track. So it's not the same, and it's not the same because if you have so many more and numerous particles, you don't activate them all, but you still see a clear signal here. If we assume that the water vapor hasn't changed, then you have more droplets competing for the available water vapor so they don't grow as large, and you see that in the reduced size of the drops. And putting this together, more numerous and smaller drops, you see this increase in, in reflectivity in the cloud albedo. And so then this is here what shows up. And this would be the end in, of the story if it would be so easy. It turns out, as it turns out, you don't observe ship tracks all the time. Because 
the environment is not stable like that all the time. It's similar to contrails from the airplanes. You don't see them all the time either. Because sometimes there are adjustments, and the adjustments that can go on can be larger than the initial forcing itself. And that is actually another reason <coughs> to, to, to consider this everything together here. Because what good does it do if you have an artificial forcing and the adjustment, say, because you have more numerous and smaller cloud drops, say, if they evaporate much more readily and you don't see it. Um, now, this is telling me, 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 you, that it should be like that. But we actually did do a study a while ago before mm -hmm. the IPCC report came out to compare this. If you can actually compare the radiative forcing with the effective forcing and how different is that. And in order to make the point that what we really want to be looking at, that we really want to be looking at an effective forcing where the fast adjustments are taking into account, we did this for uh, CO2 and methane, so for real normal species. And the difference is if you do it, if you do a climate model simulation where you do a radiative forcing calculation, what you would do is, as I say, you keep everything constant, but you vary the forcing agent. So either the greenhouse gas concentration, the aerosol concentration, or cloud drop number, and everything else is constant. Whereas what you do here is the method that normal GCMs do it that way. You just have two different simulations starting with different emissions. One with pre-industrial, one with present day, and you look at the difference. But then what you get automatically are all those fast feedbacks. They are all included there. So what we, and, and the other thing is you cannot disentangle them anymore once they are included because you only see the final product so you don't know what each individual effect is. And so we did that here to prove that you can actually do that. We did this for CO2 here in, in black, methane, the that was still called the direct aerosol effect and the indirect aerosol effect. And you see, so this is different climate models in these different categories. And the important point to note is they pretty much lie on the one-to-one -one line, except for CO2. And that has to do with um, its cooling in the stratosphere. So if you look at the forcing at the tropopause instead of the top of the atmosphere, you get into agreement. And then you can decompose it, but basically the message here is global mean values are comparable. We also looked at this latitudinally. So this is zonal means here from the different models. And it's a similar answer here. So this is in black is the pure forcing calculation. And in red, it's with the fast feedbacks. And this is for the uh, cloud albedo is first indirect effect, or what we now call radiative forcing due to aerosol cloud interaction. And for all the models, basically, if you take fast feedbacks into account, you get a, just a noisy version. But you get more or less the same answer. So you said, OK, if this is so, then actually IPCC can change and now really include the effect of radiative forcing. And this is what we have done. And this is probably the summary slide if you work on aerosol cloud interactions where all the knowledge that we have gathered is included. And actually um, stems from an early version that Trude puts together and <laughs> where she basically started to be really good to every paper that was published that um, on aerosol cloud interaction, she reported what the forcing values are. And that's what we took over for IPCC. And what you see here is like, this would be the direct effect. Um, this here would be the pure forcing, so first indirect effect. And this here is, no, actually not uh, pure. It's the effect of radiative forcing due to aerosol cloud interaction. So the indirect effect with fast feedbacks included. And here's the sum of direct and indirect. And we said, really what we are interested in is the sum of that, because this is what matters, right? It's the combined forcing that offsets part of the greenhouse gas warming. So this is what we're interested in. 
Um, and then the problem is if you look at this, the different symbols present different studies. So this here is prior to that the fourth IPCC report was published. This year is after that. Um, this group here of models is interesting, and I come back to that later on. Um, those are the ones that are used for forward calculation for future simulations. And those models have to agree with the observed temperature record. So there are models in here that if they included aerosol cloud interactions would have not been able to reproduce the observed temperature range, but it would have caused them to cool. Because of that, they don't have it. But you can see that overall, they have rather smaller signs than if, if you compare this to the overall box. And then there's some other studies that are worth highlighting. This year's Trudel's paper, for instance. Those are <laughs> the ones <laughs> that consider also aerosol effect in mixed phase clouds. And there's quite a, sp a spread that you can see here. What we have been doing, because the IPCC is that you have to come up with an expert judgment of what you think is the right value. And we said, okay, to do that, we only consider the latest version of any given climate model. Because there's only three climate models or so that really look at aerosol effects on mixed phase clouds. That's what Trude does, what I do, and some others, not too many. A little more, it's four actually altogether because we have four stars. But in order not to bias it towards our models, we only considered the latest version of each modeling center. And then there were some models that take aerosol effects in convective clouds into account, and you see here even a much larger spread. And you see something that can't be possibly true because the minus 3.5 watts per meter square negative forcing would have said there's no temperature warming, we actually go towards a cooling. And the other thing to notice is that here are some studies where satellite data were taken into account. And they overall have a much smaller radiative forcing. And this is partly because, I was just chatting with, some, with, with somebody before, the satellite of course has the problem, you cannot detect aerosols and clouds at the same time. And you cannot look at warm clouds, low level clouds, if there's clouds overlying. So they are biased somehow, but we don't know to what extent. But if you take the average of the satellite studies, it comes out to be way less negative than if you take the average from the GCMs. And we were st stuck with st starting asking us, what is the truth? What is it really what we know? And all we know is that probably the truth is somewhere in between. And that's why we picked the value that's somewhere in between. But we inflated the uncertainty range because if you only focus on the newest studies, you have quite a narrow range. And we know that the uncertainty is much, much, much larger than that. So the expert judgment, and this is then really people sitting together and discussing it until you have heard all the other arguments, is somewhere that the aerosol, total aerosol forcing should be negative minus 0.9 with an uncertainty range between 0.1 and minus 9 watts per meter square, somewhere there. But there are still uncertainties from that. And I'm actually now switching topics a little bit and go a little more into why ice why mixed phase clouds, why ice is so uncertain. And it's actually one of, th one of the reasons why ice is so uncertain is because ice crystal formation can be done in very many different ways. You, so what you see here is the relative humidity with respect to ice, and here's the temperature. And if you form a cloud, a normal water cloud, you find cloud droplets that are formed very close to 100% relative humidity. But that is not true if you go to ice clouds. The supersaturations with respect to ice, they can be up to 170, 180% quite high, and you don't form a cloud. And that's very, very different. And that is because we don't have so many aerosol particles acting as ice nuclei around. Um, and so that is one point, I come back to that. But also the question is how? How are the aerosols interacting? How are they acting as ice nuclei? They can do it by collision, colliding with a supercool cloud droplet, 
So that has to be here. So this black line is at water saturation. This happens once you have already a water droplet that collides and freezes. Or you could have the ice nucleus being immersed in the droplet, initiating the freezing. Or you could temporarily build a water film that freezes. All the drops, and that will happen in deep convective clouds, for instance, if, you, if they rise quick enough and there's no suitable ice nucleus in it, then they could freeze homogeneously once the temperature is somewhere below minus 35, minus 38 degrees centigrade. Um, or when you look at cirrus clouds, then if you have a typical trajectory leading to a cirrus cloud, it normally, the air parcel normally rises through cloud tree air. And then what could happen? Two, there's two possible ways, or three actually. One, you could have a solution droplet like sulf sulfate aerosols. They take up some water until it is diluted enough that it can initiate freezing. Or you can have again immersion freezing, but normally here it's within some kind of a solution, so some sulfate or so. Or you could have directly vapor depositing on that. So it's a huge zoo that you see there. Seven different possible pathways that you can think of. And then the next question is, what particles, what particles in the atmosphere do we have that are good at ice formation? So this is actually work from Corinna Hose, who was like uh, swapping places with where to work with Trude. So Corinna did her PhD with me and moved to P Norway, and at the same time Trude switched and went from Norway to Switzerland. So <laughs> they know each other pretty well. Um, so here, what she then, she classified then all the different studies that you have on ice nucleation. And so this looks even much more of a zoo than the, the figure I showed you from the uh, radiative forcing that Trude put together. What do, you, what do you see when you look here? The thing that you see is that there's a large area that's red, and that's to guide you that this is where you find dust, mineral dust acting as an ice nucleus. And I think this is the thing that we agree upon as a community that dust is important. It nucleates ice at rather warm temperatures up to around minus 10. These are all laboratory data. When you look here, there's a little bit of a size dependence in there. So here the dust, if it's a star, is larger than one micron and all the crosses are smaller than a micron. So the large particles start to nucleate ice first. Um, there's a few that are unphysical because you cannot sustain relative humidities over water saturation. That's not possible. That is measurement artifacts. That also shows you that we can't measure that too well. And then there's something that looks promising in order to form ice at the warmest temperatures, and that's a so-called bioaerosols, so bacteria, fungi, um, spores, um, pollen, so whatever. The only problem is that it's not yet clear if they play an important role in the atmosphere because they are large, and the question is, do they really get there where the ice clouds are or not? It doesn't seem to be that they are numerous enough to really have a big impact. And then the question is, we have what, what is really numerous in the atmosphere would be soot or organics, but they for one are smaller. And when you look at this here, they don't really form ice at the warmest temperatures. Maybe they are important for cirrus, but if they are important for mixed phase clouds, doesn't look like that because they, they only appear close to the line where you have water saturation already. And then they probably are not so helpful if they have to compete with dust or bioparticles. But we don't know. The jury is still out there. But when I, so when I started climate modeling, I was interested in looking at the aerosol effect also on ice. And so I said, okay, I, I, I think we need to do some measurements, and that's how I got into doing some measurements. And what we have done at ETH is that we have developed instruments for all those different modes of ice nucleation that I showed you. Homogeneous, deposition, condensation, immersion, contact, 
So we build different apparatuses for that and can study that. And so to show you some proof of concept that we, that we actually know what we are doing, we look here at immersion freezing data. We have here silver iodide, which has been known from old cloud seeding studies that this is good because it has a crystal match that is similar to ice, but you don't find it in the atmosphere. And here is some, so this, this study aims at looking at biological particles, so we succeeded to have some birch, but it's washing water, so what they found, and that's quite interesting, is that uh, if you take biological particles and wash them and take that water, um, yeah, and, 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 and study the freezing of that water after you have washed the pollen, it starts to nucleate ice. So it's not the whole pollen that you need, but there's some protein or whatsoever that gets washed off the surface and initiates freezing. And yeah, and so we can, we, we agree that this, this is if more efficient than mineral dust. So kaolinite is a mineral dust, and you see that here. But there's, for instance, the pine, pine trees, they don't do anything. Pine washing water doesn't do anything. So there's nothing on the needles that this is homogeneous freezing down here, so there is nothing. Um, yeah, so, so um, it works. What we, what we also try to look at is the size dependence on freezing. I, sh I mentioned before in Corinna's big figure that the larger the particle, the better they are. But one of the questions we were wondering if is there minimum size? Do the particles have to be of any minimum size to, to nucleate ice? And so the way you would define it is if there is um, sufficient freezing before here, they hit this gray bar, which is homogeneous freezing. And so this is mineral dust. This is called Arizona test dust. And you see the most, the largest particles, they initiate freezing at the warmest temperatures. And then the frozen fraction is of one, where all the particles are frozen is reached at the warmest temperatures. And thereafter, it's not so, not so efficient. And we concluded from that it's around 100 nanometers, because this is also textbook knowledge. You need around 0.1 micrometer particles. <coughs> but it's not really true that you need that, because we also did silver iodide for some other reasons. And if you look at silver iodide particle, you can freeze on much smaller particles than you can with, with, with mineral dust. And the rationale here is that it's because the silver iodide, it has such a similar structure to ice that the lattice match is so good that also smaller particles can actually cause ice formation. But what, and what you notice here is that there doesn't seem to be much of a size dependence between 40 nanometer and larger which would make sense if I said the lattice match is so good, so it freezes, it nucleates ice regardless. But something changes when you come to being smaller than 40 nanometers. And that has to do with that silver iodide can be, uh, yeah, silver iodide can dissolve in water. And so what we calculated is how long it takes before the silver iodide particle. So this here is our chapter. Uh, chamber that we have, we have around four seconds residence time in the chamber. And if you look at the, it's the same color code as before. So these are the 40 nanometer particles, those are the largest, and this is the th 30 nanometer, and this here is the 20 nanometer particle. And you see that all the larger ones survive, but the 20 nanometer dissolves, and dissolves rather quickly, really quickly. Whereas the 30 nanometer takes a quite a while to dissolve. And this is what you see reflected here. If they, if they are so large that they cannot dissolve because the solution would be way too saturated, and, uh, and, and the dissolution is not that fast, you see that they are very efficient even if they are within a drop. But if they are able to dissolve and the solution is still not saturated, so they dissolve completely, you're left with just homogeneous freezing. 
So what this is nice is that that tells us something about the physical process going on. This is not because it's atmospherically relevant. There's not a lot of silver iodide out there. Uh, okay. But let me. So the other thing that that is really complicated. So and if yes, like somebody in the audience has a good idea what's going on. Um, uh, it's like the question is, it was often hypothesized, or the actually, let's put it that way. The way I drew, or Corinna drew this schematic here, is suggest that contact freezing is more efficient, and more efficient meaning that it starts at warmer temperatures than the immersion. And so the question is, why should that be? If you have a collision between an ice nucleus and a droplet, is that really efficient or not? It, it may release some energy. Maybe it's the difference in the surface because you have three different interfaces. You have air, you have the liquid, you have the ice. Um, but it's not, there's not too many studies that are able to compare the two. And so we attempt to do that, and we are actually not here. We are actually not so sure that we have really meaningful results by now. What we tried here, again, this is a mineral dust. We tried to compare it with contact freezing, with the immersion. And it looks like we may see some warmer temperature where the, where the dust activates if it comes into contact. But there's a lot of noise in our data. And it also, yeah, that there's a lot of noise. And it's not consistent. It's maybe until a certain frozen fraction, and then they are indistinguishable. It doesn't really de matter. It doesn't depend too much on the size. That seems, if anything, maybe here is, is contact is more efficient. And then we thought, OK, maybe we understand that maybe our collision chamber isn't long enough that enough collisions take place. And so we are limited by the average number of collisions. And that's why we don't get to any higher frozen fraction. And so we made a longer chamber. And now we have some, uh, and that's actually why we did all the silver iodide simulations, because mm -hmm. we had to figure out if we can really find frozen fractions all the way up to one. Can we really freeze all the particles? And silver iodide is nice in that way because silver iodide particles we can create in really large concentration. And with mineral dust, you can't. They are too large, and we don't get high number concentration. And so here we see something that, yes, we get maybe not to one, but we get maybe up to 80% if we have large enough concentration. But if you now look at this figure more closely, silver iodide before was shown to be one of the best, most, yeah, at the best ice nuclei initiating freezing at the warmest temperatures. And that's why it was used early on in cloud seeding studies. And this here is rather cold. This here is already at minus 15 or something like that. That's not the minus 4 to minus 5 that we know from literature. And so we, we took those data, and this is now for a smaller concentration, and compared it with our immersion freezing. And we see, we, see we, get it, we get an immersion freezing, at least it's at, at, at decent temperatures of minus 10. It's even not the same as what we have with other studies have seen. But not with contact, so we, we just don't know what's going on there. Either it doesn't want to act as a contact nucleus, or we have problems with our chamber design, we just don't know. But those are, <laughs> those are, this is really hard to explain what should be going on there. It's really hard. The only thing that, that I know for sure is that uh, it, it works because that was the, what the free previous figure showed. We are able to, to find ice formation, so we don't know. Yeah, a little bit. We don't really know. So then I can show you something mm -hmm. that I do know. And what I do understand is that when we look at, the, when we look at observations, so we also, I started off with showing you a pretty, pretty picture from Jungfraujoch. And this now we go there, we have been going there since around five or six years and have regularly taken measurements of ice nuclei concentration there. And um, 
because it's at 3,500 meters, and if you go there in winter, you are in the free troposphere. If you go there in summer, if you go in June, then you can have, um, then you have much higher concentrations. And SDE means that we capture Sahara dust events. And if you go during a Sahara dust event, you find that you have two orders of magnitude higher um, ice nuclei concentration, and that makes sense. So then there's a lot of Sahara dust that you see, and we know dust is a good ice nucleus, that all makes sense. And that you have higher concentrations in summer than in winter could be some evidence of biological particles, because in summer you do get the boundary layer air being hot coming up, and then you would have trees there, you would have the really biological particles. We don't know yet what they are, but we are planning to going back to in the summer to understand what's going on. And there seemed to be quite a year, bit of year-to-year -year variability. So the background ice nucleation in the con ice nucleation concentration, ice nuclei concentration in the atmosphere, is rather variable and can be rather low. So that's what to conclude from here. And now also, and now this comes back to goes back to the the studies that you are doing here with a supercooled liquid. What we also have is a holographic device that can make pictures of ice crystals and water droplets. And from that, so you see it here, it's here in the box. And here you see Jungfraujoch, if it's in the clouds, because you don't see anything. It could be uh, everywhere, but it's on Jungfraujoch. <laughs> and, and originally, what we want to figure out is how, what is the microstructure? How exactly does the microstructure look like? Do we have pockets of crystals and other pockets of water, or is it homogeneously mixed? And of course, I mean, if you have everywhere a cloud droplet next to a crystal, then this Bergeron process would be very efficient, right? That the ice crystals grow at the expense of the water droplets. We don't know that yet. What we do know, and this is where some fun questions of fun science comes in, if you look at the supercooled liquid water fraction from observations. And that's what Trude has been doing from satellite data. Here, the, these are observations from Canada inside stratiform supercooled clouds, different temperatures. You seem to find much more of a U shape in that it's most of the time either completely water or completely ice. And Alexei Korolev, who gave me those data, has reanalyzed his data. And this is now for all of them together. It's really much more of a U-shape. So this is in clear contrast to the Calliope data from you. And I actually, I should tell you, actually, by the way, that somebody told me that they have been reanalyzed and they also look more U-shaped. But we need to talk about it. Anyhow. And <laughs> when we looked in Jungfraujoch, we found the same, almost the same, as what Alexei Korolev has from aircraft data in Canada here. But notice that it says here south wind. And if, we come, if the wind comes from the north, then we find much higher fraction of supercooled liquid. And now the orography at Jungfraujoch is kind of like this. So if it's from north, it's much steeper. You have much higher updraft velocities. So what we hypothesize, or what we think happens, is that here, because you have much higher updraft velocities, you exceed saturation with respect to water all the time, so you form new cloud droplets. But that would be that there's quite a bit of dynamics that are Im important for that, and it's not just the microphysical thing that's going on, but that the updraft velocity m seems to be of major importance there. Okay, and with that, I actually switch back a little bit more to global. So this is what you know. This is your paper. Um, this is here the Calliope data now of the supercooled fraction. And that, if it's true, but I heard, as I said, that they have been reanalyzed and may not show this huge dependence anymore. This would agree much better to our the data from Jungfraujoch for the north slope. This would fit to that much nicer. At the other point I would take away from here um, is that you see no, none of the climate model seems to get this temperature dependence right. They either have too much supercooled liquid or too little. And there is probably an implication for that on the total aerosol forcing. 
because if you look at this, the variation you have here is more than a watt per meter square. And that could very well be related to how much supercooled liquid they have or not. It could be related to many other things, but it could be something to do with that. Um, one last point. Um, I said before, there was this, when I showed you the, the IPCC diagram of the aerosol forcing, I, I, I said that there were models in there uh, that were used to calculate the temperature evolution from pre-industrial to present. And what we did, and it was a paper that we have in preparation, is to look at the different climate models who participated and group them into those that are too warm or hot GCMs, and that refers to a reference period here centered between 1460 to 1460. 1940 to 1960, so the right ones in green and the cold ones in blue. And it looks like, and there's a, that the, the, these hot ones are actually some that don't take indirect aerosol effects into account, just by when you look at the different, uh, at, at their model description. We could also show that, that they really have too little, uh, uh, too little of an aerosol forcing by comparing here their total forcing. And the total forcing is more or less the sum of greenhouse gases and aerosols. So if the aerosol forcing is, l is large, then the total forcing is small because the CO2 is more or less is comparable at least. And so you see here those warm GCMs, they have a rather high total forcing, so that means they have a rather small aerosol forcing. And what's shown here on the x-axis is what's called climate resistance, that's the climate feedback parameter, how you translate the forcing into temperature and the ocean heat uptake. And it's also true that those hot models don't put the heat efficiently enough into the ocean. And if you put both of that together, you can conclude that the total aerosol forcing is at least 0.2 watts per meter square too weak in them, or maybe even 0.4, it depends on the heat uptake or not. But there seem to be some suggestion that maybe actually the overall aerosol forcing from those CMIP-5 models should be more negative than it actually is. Um, and there's actually other studies who, who agree with that. Um, Okay, and then one very last point is the question of how complicated should we actually look at aerosol effects in climate models. What happened lately is there has been a tendency for all the models to become more and more complex with time and now include secondary organics and nitrate and whatever else you can think of. And you do need it for depending on what you want to study. But the question is, do you also need that for getting, getting realistic aerosol forcings or not? So how much of the details of the aerosol physics do you actually need? And that's where we have done some preliminary studies on that. And I'm just showing here you one result, one outcome of that, is where we compared the forcing estimates from, say, focus in the middle here, say, the forcing estimates from where we have online aerosols, so we have our different aerosol species in the different size classes and everything online, or when we from that construct three-dimensional means of the aerosol, keep the dependence of supersaturation that you need for aerosol activation, and then feed that back in, and you see that the Overall, the net forcing, so this on the right here is the net forcing, is pretty much comparable. Maybe there's some small difference, but the difference is much smaller than if you go to a different version of our model. And here's yet another version of the model. So what we seem to find, that the details of how we treat aerosols, here again, you can also compare again red and blue here, they seem to be smaller than if we change model versions from one model version to the next. 
what is a little scary at the moment is that, that we don't really know why all in a sudden we have this large long wave effect here that's popping up. All we know is that we fixed some bugs in the cloud microphysics, so that shouldn't really make such big of a difference. But, <laughs> <laughs> but what it says, and the other difference that you also see in here, how does it depend on how you do the simulation? Not means that you have one year where you force the model towards the observed observations from the analysis, or this is how you have the model running in free mode, what you do if you go into future predictions or so. And again, they seem to be, those seem to be rather comparable, or at least more comparable than if you switch model versions. So there seem to be something in our model version switch that we need to understand what's going on there. Okay, and so with that, let me tr summarize what I've shown you, um, it's still after the fifth IPCC assessment report, it's still the same that the total uncertainty due to aerosol radiation and aerosol cloud interaction is the largest uncertainty that we have in the anthropogenic forcing. There's lots of uncertainties remaining in the details of ice nucleation. We do know that ice nuclei re require a minimum size but that's not a unique size, but that depends on the species. So it's much larger for mineral dust than it is, for instance, for silver iodide. Um, and yeah, the GCMs that simulate a higher temperature than observed in the 20th century, we can have shown that they, their aerosol forcing is too small. So they should be, that should be more negative. And then maybe there is a point that we, depending on what, what we are trying to study, not everything requires the, the details of all the different aerosol processes. It depends, you, re, you need that a lot when you are, if you want to understand feedback, say, between the biosphere and the atmosphere, then of course you need VOCs and SOA and all that. But if it's just for forcing estimates, maybe you just don't need it. Maybe you can just get away with monthly means. But those results are rather preliminary, is what I would say. And with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention.